Nein, jetzt habe ich drauf. Jetzt ist alles weg. Okay, so good afternoon to everybody and welcome to the Lewis Masterclass of, of today. Um, it is a great pleasure to, to host um, um, and welcome all of you for this, what is going to be a very compelling, interesting discussion in and around what is going to happen after, after COVID. We have left on purpose the, the, uh, the theme of this masterclass relatively broadened because the the profile, the academic profile and the industry profile of the two guest speakers are really, are really you know, forward looking. And so I'm pretty sure we're gonna be having a forward looking perspective on what is gonna happen after COVID. Uh, I'm Andrea Prenchebe, I'm director of Lewis University and I'm gonna be your host for today. So as I mentioned, we, we have two uh, distinguished speakers for us today, Professor Elgar Nowotny, who is a, is a professor emeritus at ETH in Zurich, professor of uh, social studies of science. She, Elga is a widely published academic in the area of social studies of science, and she has also been the former uh, president of the European Research Council. Um, the industry leader of today who will be discussing with Elga is Mr. Luigi Gubicosi, who is the CEO mm -hmm. of TIM, uh, an Italian telecommunication operator, Luigi's expertise, industry exp expertise, span a large number of sectors, from automotive to broadcasting, from TLC telecommunication to also uh, to um, airlines. So again, we're going to be uh, assisting to a very interesting discussion in and around the role of science and scientists or after COVID. But now I'd like to, to leave the floor to Professor Paola Severino, who is our Vice President for opening remarks. Paola, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, uh, Andrea, and good afternoon. Uh, it is truly uh, a great pleasure for me uh, to open today's uh, Louis Masterclass and uh, greet uh, our uh, two guests. Uh, an eminent professor, as you were saying, uh, Andrea, um, and uh, an extraordinary CEO who uh, is also a personal friend. So I am particularly uh, happy to be here. Uh, the question we are called um, upon to answer, uh, COVID-19, what's next, uh, brings uh, all kinds of unknowns, but also prospects for a different future. Uh, situations of emergency, I am thinking of wars or severe epidemics uh, as the one we are currently facing, certainly uh, generate enormous uh, difficulties. Nonetheless, uh, they also act uh, as motivation for an uh, innovative uh, development of the economy and for social change. Uh, the first signals uh, um, of these are already visible uh, in the new provisions uh, uh, which are based on, the, on an agreement of trust uh, between, uh, between uh, the government and its citizens. I am referring uh, not only in Italy, but also in Germany, for example, to the state uh, guarantee loans granted on the basis of self-declaration, something totally new uh, in our economic and uh, uh, juridical world, uh, uh, which was generated by this uh, emergency. Further signals come from universities which had to promptly uh, shift to online education and online seminars. The excellent results achieved demonstrate that traditional teaching methods and innovative teaching models can interact uh, and that such an integration bades well also for the future. I think that uh, we have to elaborate a strategy and uh, to put in um, balance these two uh, ways for uh, these two ways, traditional and in innovative uh, way for teaching. Uh, last but not least, we have seen a sharp acceleration in Italy's digitalization process, uh, which has reached the, 
uh, new groups uh, of our citizens, the youngest, the eldest, and teachers uh, in all kinds and all levels of our schools. We are therefore extremely glad to welcome our two eminent guests, uh, one healing from academia and research, and one from telecommunications sector, who will share with us their invaluable opinions on this topic. We are very deeply interested in their uh, answers so that together we may work toward an answer to the question, COVID-19, what's next? On this question, I give the floor to our uh, dear Professor Helga Nowotny. Thank you, Helga, for being with us. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Paula. It's a very great pleasure for me to be able to address you tonight. And the topic that we all have been living with in these past weeks and months is indeed the unknown and how we are going to encounter the future. Now, as Paula already said, there are energies that have also been set free during this period of lockdown. There are small innovation plans that have grown up and it will also depend on us what we do with it. But let me take one step back and um, remind ourselves of a book that was written in 1944 by Karl Polanyi called The Great Transformation. It's worth rereading. Polanyi goes back to the time when the, the modern market uh, idea came up, how people changed their economic mindset. And it was together with the modern state that the market economy developed. And he calls it the great transformation. And I would claim that we find ourselves right now also in a transformation. This was not planned, it was not, maybe not even wanted, but it's a transformation that was triggered and that was pushed by the pandemic. Namely, th this tiny virus pushed all of us into the digital world. And we are accelerating our voyage in this digital world. Now, <clears throat> what happened in the, in the past months? What have we learned about what happened? I think, uh, first of all, we have to say the pandemic as such was not completely a surprise. Epidemics have been predicted. It was what we can call a known unknown. Nobody could say when, nobody could say how much it would spread, nor think of this enormous economic and social fallout. But nevertheless, we were not prepared for it. We also learned very quickly, and this is something that in science happens all the time, what we don't know as yet. But at the same time, and there was a lot that was not known about uh, the virus and how it affects uh, the human organism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But at the same time, it was amazing how fast the genome of the virus was sequenced, how the sequences were shared around the world, how fast people were detecting what kind of mutations are happening, etc., etc. And mind you, right now, while I speak, there are worldwide around 90 firms that are working um, to get a vaccine against it. What we also <clears throat> noticed uh, was to be able to observe science in the making. It was not just science with the finished product, it was the process. And the process of science happens, it's always a move towards the unknown. You want to find out what is happening, but it's always research is inherently uncertain. And so people learned that what, if it depends on the assumptions, if you want to know about the outcome, you also have to look at the assumptions that you put into your model. People learned that knowledge develops very quickly. It's temporary because, you know, the next day we have new findings that are sufficiently robust that we can say 
you know, the findings of yesterday have been replaced by something that is more robust, more robust knowledge that we have. And also um, the relationship to, to politics um, was changed in the sense that at least initially, politics, politicians everywhere had to listen to what science had to say. And according to the service we have, you know, trust in science was re-established. I remember just a few years ago, everywhere in Europe, we had the marches for science um, against populists who were undermining expertise and science, etc. So trust in science has been has been um, <clears throat> uh, restored, at least for the time being. And of course, scientists are very much aware that this is a precious uh, resource that needs to be kept. But what I want to emphasize is that the importance of data is something that is going to stay. And data is related to digitalization. And <clears throat> after the crisis will be over, we will see that we are faced with the importance of data in ways that we were not aware of before. This pertains also to the social sciences and to economics. A number of initiatives during the crisis were already started. Can you get data now that later on uh, are difficult to get? How do people cope with the crisis? Who is um, in a home office uh, with children? You know, what happens? What happens to the children when uh, there is only homeschooling, et cetera, et cetera. So all this has been going on as data. There's even a platform for social science research called uh, the World uh, Pandemic Research Network. And again, you know, it's data that we want to share because this is the way how knowledge uh, proceeds. Now, <clears throat> with data, we know the quality matters, where they are, how to find them. And somehow I feel we need a map of data. We don't really know, neither in Austria, nor in Italy, nor anywhere else, do we know what, what, where are our data? What kind of data do we have? So, and if I speak of a map, I think also a map is useful for navigation and um, navigate towards the future and it is, the f we, we need maps for navigating in this big unknown of digitalization. And this is why I want to emphasize it is important that we keep thinking about data, how to get them, how to curate them, how to share them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, in this uh, navigation in the digital world into which the virus has pushed us, we are facing uncertainty. When our ancestors in Italy, you know, going out on the sea, uh, sailing, there is always the uncertainty what is beyond what you can see. And somehow we are in a similar situation. But at the same time, digitalization has given us some interesting tools that allow us to navigate, that allow us perhaps even to find a compass but above all, they allow us to see, to look a little bit further. And these are algorithms. This is what is called predictive analytics. And in this um, sea of uncertainty, I think um, we find similarities in the way how institutions and also people are coping with uncertainty. And I'm thinking here in particular of how management, research, and innovation cope with uncertainty. For research, as I said, especially for fundamental research, um, uncertainty is inherent in what you do. If you know already the outcome, you are no longer doing fundamental research. You are applying knowledge that you already have, but it's not the same. And for researchers, this is very exciting to, to have this push towards the unknown, to move out into the unknown. With um, innovation, you never know, will you be successful or not? 
And all the case studies we have on successful innovation, it can depend on initial conditions. It is a certain constellation of timing, etc., etc. But again, it's an uncertain process because you cannot be sure that you will succeed. And in management, um, the managers whom I have met and be able to talk to, they all know about uncertainty and decision making under conditions of uncertainty. And uh, even if they don't like to admit it, uh, nevertheless, they are very much aware of it. And a good manager will always tell you, don't give me a data point, give me a range. So this is at least one way of trying to map the, the uncertainty. Now, back to these um, predictive analytics and, and to algorithms. Uh, the situation and the moment in which we find ourselves now is a relatively recent. Of course, artificial intelligence, it goes back already to the last century. Uh, computers uh, were developed in, in Princeton in the, in the mid of the last century. The first computer, John von Neumann, Alan Turing, uh, and so on. But now we are at a moment in time where we have a convergence of an enormous amount of data and we all contribute to this enormous amount of data by the traces we leave. Every telephone call, every time we use a credit card, etc., we leave traces. Every time we make a selfie, we leave traces that um, become data and that feed the algorithms. And the algorithms don't really know what is cause and effect. They don't care, so to speak. They correlate what has happened in the past. They extrapolate from our past behavior and they project what we are going to buy next time, whom we, which restaurants we prefer, with whom we will meet, uh, etc. And the computational power has increased. So it is this convergence that gives this so much power. And at the same time, we know there are risks that are associated with it. We have concerns about privacy. We need new kinds of regulations. The question how to tax the big corporations is an unresolved one. Um, we know that there are also possibilities of misuse, abuse, fake news, et cetera, et cetera. Nevertheless, um, if we think of it in terms of the transformation we are in, and I, I really believe we are in a big process of uh, transformation, and it's not like Polyani thought only about markets, and now you could say, well, globalization, had to recede, we will restart. No, I think it's a transformation that goes much deeper because we are really on a co-evolutionary trajectory between machines that we have created as humans and humans. And this is what makes it very exciting. But at the same time, um, we are sailing in the unknown and we better make sure that we have good tools that will help us to, to navigate. And this is the third point I want to raise. Um, and this also came up in uh, a, a talk I had with, with Luigi before. You know, what does this digital transformation that we find ourselves in, what does it mean for, for innovation? Now, innovation, you know, we speak um, since 30 years about um, innovation in two kinds. There's the radical innovation and there are the incremental uh, innovation. Now, radical innovations are rare and they are profound. And of course, this digital transformation goes back to one of these radical, namely the computational revolution, as we can call it. Um, but innovation uh, at, at the same time is not what many people thought for a long time. It's not a linear model. You start out with basic research, you apply it, you go to the market. This is not how it actually works. And therefore, people dealing with innovation from an academic point of view and analyzing it, 
um, came up with this idea, we have to think of innovation as an ecosystem. Just as we have ecosystems in nature, ecology, we should think about innovation where you have um, an, an ecosystem that is interrelated. You have, um, of course, you have firms, you have business, you have academia, you have researchers that are a bit <clears throat> all over, not only in, in universities, but you also have um, regulations, you have a, a framework, a legal framework that matters, and you have people <clears throat> who are users, customers, but who also have to um, become part of this ecosystem. And so I think we could also uh, ask the question, I will end with this and then engage in discussion with, with Luigi. You know, if we look at this ecosystem, we can ask, you know, where <clears throat> is innovation likely to happen? How, who, and when? So where it's the obvious places to look for <clears throat> are known, there's no, no secret about it, even if it's very difficult to, uh, to tackle the, the real complexity of it. And I will start with the health system. Healthcare system is enormously complex. And as we saw now, how much better would we have fared if it had been already more digitalized? having access to data quickly, diagnosis, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, universities are in for a major change, not only in the US and in the UK, where the model is very different, also we on the, um, in continental Europe. And we have, a, apart from what it will do to teaching and research, and Paula mentioned this already, I think we have a big opportunity, namely to use digitalization to reach people out in society in ways that were not possible or not used before. Of course, you had adult courses, et cetera, you had lifelong learning, but it did not really reach and affect people in the way that they can now be affected. And I think for universities, it is worthwhile to start to think about it, how you, how you can do that. Of course, <clears throat> you always have to start as early as possible with kids um, in, in, in the schools. And we also saw now in every country, you saw um, the big um, digital divide that is already there. Uh, between the kids for whom homeschooling was okay because the parents were able to help them, the digital infrastructure at home was there, and the other kids who had neither, neither parents who could help them, neither the, the minimal digital infrastructure that you need at home. And if we start already with kids, you can imagine what it means when these are young people who are looking for jobs. So I think to think about the digital divide and how to innovate the school system in such a way that we are preventing this digital divide to become deeper and if possible to avoid it altogether. I think this is one of the priorities. Then of course, um, what will happen to the office in the future, etc. All this is, is, is well known. So we know where. But um, innovation, the history of innovation teaches us very often innovation happens at the margin. At the margins of systems that, and institutions that seem to be already well established. And then innovation happens at the margins and it moves in different directions and it creates something new. So when we think innovation where, let's look at the interfaces, let's look at the, <clears throat> at the margins where two systems meet or three systems meet and overlap and dig deeper there. How? <clears throat> well, um, I think we will have more interdisciplinarity in the future. To speak about and ask for interdisciplinarity has been a long demand. And uh, some of you may remember this one um, um, cry that came out at the conference, the world has problems, the university has departments. 
Yeah. And this was the kind of feeling that many people had, um, you know, disciplines are um, <clears throat> sealing off knowledge where there should be much more interchange. And I've spent a good part of my life trying to overcome these uh, barriers between uh, disciplines. But now we see also this goes beyond um, informatics, computer science, and to involve economics, uh, to involve the social sciences, because we have new problems. Cybersecurity is a new problem that needs to be dealt with. The question of um, privacy and protection and rights to privacy is a big problem. People are aware of it, but it needs to be dealt with in an interdisciplinary way. Ethical issues come up again and again, and even if uh, you know people started to work on ethical AI and, and so on, um, it will accompany us. The same <clears throat> goes uh, for many other problems. And uh, so the how has to be tackled in an interdisciplinary uh, way. And I would even go so far um, without going into many definitions here, but the idea of going beyond institutional boundaries, going beyond uh, business, beyond academia, and involve uh, civil society, involve the users everywhere. This is a kind of transdisciplinarity that is very much called for, and we have to um, push for this kind of openness and think in innovative ways. How can we actually open up and bring in people um, because their their life world, their experience is is part of what needs to it's the, the way how to cultivate and, and feed this innovative search. And who well, <clears throat> of course, innovation actually happens in firms in the strict sense. This is where uh, it's, it's done, but of course, firms are not alone. And um, in places that I have seen where the cooperation with industry and academia works well, there, there, there are seven models. So let me just briefly mention some. The MIT Media Lab is an interesting model because um, it, uh, it allows firms for a small fee to come in and to talk with the researchers in the media lab, see what they are doing. And there's a lot of playfulness going on there. And then if the firm says, well, there might be something of interest for me in there, then they can say, okay, let's talk about this further and take it further. So this is one model of inviting already why you do your research interested industry and let them see you know what is interesting for you as a researcher has perhaps some other kind of benefit or a different approach for someone who works in industry so to to facilitate this kind of cross fertilization another model um, I, I saw was in Singapore Singapore as you know is very innovative <clears throat> as, as a country I will come to an end um, and in uh, Singapore, on, uh, with the support of the government, the firms are invited to be on campus. And uh, this is a different model, but again, you know, it facilitates this, uh, this kind of interaction. So I think this is, if we speak about who we need to think, which kind of models are good. And when, this is my, my last point, and the answer is very Simple, namely, now. Let's start now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Erga. That was a very interesting and compelling perspective of your view on, uh, on what is going to happen. Uh, you have gone from uh, an interesting label on uh, the current situation, as you've labeled as unknown unknowns, uh, which has spurred uh, you know, a process of transformation, which is extremely interesting to be observed. Second, then you talked about the importance of data and the extent to which you know, we can somehow exploit the convergence of the data availability, computational power for innovation purposes. And, and then you also mentioned 
that would probably a, a good way, uh, an appropriate way to understand and conceptualize innovation is to understand it as an ecosystem of innovation so that we can also uh, identify the role and rules of the interaction amongst the different actors that uh, network for towards towards um, innovation and of course last but not least the role of connecting different disciplines uh, to to uh, face and address societal problems so from interdisciplinarity to transdisciplinarity let me now give the floor to to luigi for for his his, his perspective on what's going to happen up next thank you and i i would like to start my uh, comments to Professor Novotny's speech with an image, and I'll ask Chris, the director, to show. Yes, uh, as you can see here, this is uh, an old advertising from 1919, where basically the Bell Telephone Company of Minnesota, Missouri in the United States said to people, when in quarantine, you're not isolated if you have a Bell Telephone. So uh, now we, can, we, we can go back to the normal uh, screen, but basically the, the point is that uh, indeed um, technology was useful also when, whenever there is a pandemic or whenever there, whenever there is an extraordinary situation. Uh, what, even in 1919, when we have the Spanish influenza, which killed 50 million people worldwide, as you know, the telephone system uh, actually played a significant role. And uh, at the time, that was basically the only thing, the, on, the only technology they could use. Uh, but the advertising is trying to say you're not isolated. And, and, and think now, when you come now, what would have happened if there would have not been uh, a good connectivity and a number of services to do, you know, a service like we're doing today? Everybody would be in his own spot, and maybe we could talk on the phone, but we couldn't do much more. So, Technology is indeed helpful, and uh, uh, it's also important to have a, subsi a sufficient, uh, let's say, an adequate level of technology. Because another thing that happened in 1919, and I asked the, I asked the director to send my last, second and last, advertisement: don't telephone unless it's absolutely necessary. You see, New York telephone to telephone users. At the time, now we have okay, fine, thank you. We basically today, when we move, we have to certify ourselves, the auto certificazione, as we call it, saying where we're going and so on and so forth. Back in time, my research department is telling me that, that since there was a limited number of telephone connection and actually the telephone operators were actually dying of influenza, so there were a more limited number, uh, the uh, people had to basically tell who they were calling and why. So there was a limited amount of technology. Fortunately, this has not been the case anymore. There is uh, abundant technology. And uh, uh, we made uh, incredible progress. I mean, Italy, as uh, for a number of reasons, which we, we do not have the time to, 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 to go through today, but historically been late in digitalization compared to other European countries, to, uh, to, to, which we are very, to whom we are very close in terms of education, in terms of GDP, and so on and so forth. Uh, but we've been a bit backward in, in, in adapting ICT technology. Instead, in a very few months, uh, there has been an incredible leap. It has been, a friend of mine told me, it's like in a, when in a Grand Prix, you have the safety car blocking everybody together, and so you catch up. You have the time to catch up with the others. And so in this respect, we have made more progress in percentage than other countries because we were starting from a lower percentage base. So effectively, we have done uh, uh, an enormous uh, growth in, in, in traffic on the fix, on the mobile. In general, there is an enormous amount of activity. So this, has, uh, this is something that we as a, as a country should not lose. And we have to make sure that uh, even when the pandemic has hopefully recedes and we seem to have the statistics going the right way these very few days, these very few last days, we, we, we need to make sure that we follow up. And actually, that this digitalization spread, uh, what I'm referring to is that 
our state, basically every state, as the purpose, as the objective, as the aim to provide the citizens with a number of infrastructure. And the infrastructure can be physical, you know, telecommunication infrastructure industry is obviously uh, one which has significant infrastructure, the energy infrastructure, the transportation, uh, but also some uh, invisible uh, infrastructure, justice, healthcare, um, university, I mean, instruction. So, in all these sectors, we need to make sure that there is an upgrade of the digitalization process. And this, we need to work better as a country. I think, uh, you know, uncertainty is always there. There's been a number of uh, black swans uh, in the recent past. Uh, actually, one might say that it's difficult to see a white swan these days, meaning for black swan, what is an expected event. Uh, and if you think what happens in the past, then obviously media make it uh, make it easier and more uh, and 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 the globalization make it so that uh, you know once the plug took 3 years to move from asia to europe uh, now it's uh, it, it, the, for, for the coronavirus it takes you know you know one night flight so effectively uh, will need to speed up. I think our country is doing the right moves, that, that the attitude by the citizen is appropriate, so we have to build up. In this respect, I think it's very important what you said about data. Yes, it's true, artificial intelligence being on, uh, ongoing for a long time, but this is uh, like saying that uh, risk management has been uh, ongoing since uh, the 17th century, uh, when they start making predictions. Uh, on outcomes, so, you know, statistics. Uh, what basically changing our world is the ability to compute, the power of computing. Actually, uh, Professor Notti had not mentioned, but has implied the fact that, uh, you know, the power of computing is increasing. Quantum computing is, is on its way to our, basically, companies, universities. And uh, we don't know, it's like the coronavirus vaccine, everybody said it's on its way, we don't know when it will come. We know that eventually it will arrive. And that, once again, the power of computing will change again completely. So, artificial intelligence will change most of our industries. It might not dramatically impact on a pizzeria or something like that, but it will definitely will on universities, on uh, telecom companies, on governments, on economics, on everything, and most things that, uh, at least, that human beings do. So, the power of data is there to stay. It was something that was happening even without the pandemics. I think the pandemic, uh, with all this sorrow and uh, that is, you know, disaster that has been, might have the benefit of uh, showing us the importance of technology, the importance of digital, digitalization. And, and so the next step for us as a country is really to complete our infrastructure. I think there's been too much time wasted. We should complete it. And then to build a, an infrastructure to store data safely. I think there is a big debate, and this is going to be an academic debate as well as a political debate and I think should be almost everyone's debate on how to protect data, how, how to manage data. If you think about the level of uh, discussion that has been already about the Immuni app, even before it started, uh, and a lot of people protested uh, against the fact that it would take personal data, and possibly the same people don't realize that every time they go on internet, they are giving up much more data, many more data to the internet websites that then stays around you. So this, this is a major issue that uh, um, I feel uh, it, it's very important that uh, it, it gets discussed. Um, and we have to be at least at a European level. The GDPR was a major uh, upgrade. I mean, the GDPR, I mean, the Protection Data Act of the European Union was important, but 
how is that actually uh, enforceable in Italy, for example, from foreign website? I mean, how do you do that? How do you make sure that your computer is not, there are not plenty of cookies that keep on following you, whatever you do, and uh, uh, geolocalize you and, and so on and so forth? So the, 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 a major importance is going to be on how we manage data. And this is uh, uh, something that, frankly, does not receive until today, at least, enough attention from uh, both academic, uh, political, in general, from the public at large. Uh, we are building um, important infrastructure where to keep those data, you know, the data centers. I think it would be important uh, uh, to have uh, uh, legislation that reflects the novelty of the matter. Uh, cybersecurity was mentioned by Professor Novotti. That's an incredibly important aspect. Also, because every time you do smart working, you are opening many more po entry points in your network. And you have to make sure that every single point is protected with the same strength, or otherwise, as typically, the burglars, you know, the hackers, will enter to the weakest point and then will spread to through your network. Uh, I think data has always been taken away. You know, some time, uh, you, you, some time ago, you would enter, a burglar would enter in the house of somebody who steal his money, his passport, and maybe his information. The difference today is that there is an enormous amount of data kept together. So if there is an entry, the amount of data that can be taken away it's, it's very significant and there is all our privacy and uh, uh, i think that there's been discussion on items what, uh, that we're considering you know like in italian we call it diritto all'oblio for example i mean how for how long your data needs to be kept and for how long somebody can use it so this is a, a major issue so uh, my three points uh, where yes indeed technology helps has been helpful will continue to help we need to not to lose uh, the momentum data will be dramatically important and the quantum computing and data centers and edge computing artificial intelligence will change the way we work the way we live and uh, it's important that we manage rather than that somebody else uh, get managed or the process is totally randomically the third point is that as data are becoming more important, we should understand how to keep them, how to custody them, and how to protect them. With this, I think I would like to leave some time to question and answer. So, Andrea, will stop here if you if you agree. That's very good. Thank you very much, Luigi. You, know, you gave a very interesting perspective on uh, on uh, the extent to which uh, technology does help. Uh, you know the, the way we live and how we live. That's it's pretty important. You went back to 1919 uh, to to underline this, this this fact. In fact, um, it is also interesting your view on the importance of infrastructure, technological infrastructure, which is relevant as 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 much as the say soft infrastructure, the education that that. Uh, um, Elga was was uh, uh, mentioning, and also the importance of, of data and how we can collect, manage, analyze that Elga was touched upon, but also how we can protect data. And in fact, we have a couple of questions that came in, and while they came in, you, you addressed them, so we, we don't need to, to to go back to them. There's one question I'd like to to uh, pose the two of you. It's just arrived from Ludovico, who says um, uh, who says or uh, asked better. What was, in your opinion, the biggest change occur, occurred in data collection and management uh, in this emergency? Is there something that this emergency has accelerated the number of processes? But is there anything significant that, uh, in your opinion, as, as can, can be remembered somehow? Elga, your mic. You, in, we need to, okay. in Austria, we could see every evening on television the kind of modeling that was going on with different sets of data. So this sank into the awareness of ordinary people. Then, of course, we also had a discussion on the app, having the tracing app, obligatory or voluntarily, how safe was it, etc. 
And uh, here I would say it is very important to have open discussions so that we bring the citizens on board. Otherwise, we create, again, you know, this climate of fear that will stifle any innovation that, you know, we find uh, good things to it. But then people are afraid and they think they will again be controlled by some force. And so it is very important to, to be open about it, but also to somehow empower people. And of course, the law and legal regulation is of enormous importance. So I would say we need very good, uh, you know, lawmakers in the sense that, uh, you know, it, it has been said the law always lags behind technology, which is correct because uh, science and technology are always upstream and the law has to uh, try to keep the stream not overflowing but flowing in the right direction. But still, you know, you need some very good people and discussion with lawyers. And this is again where interdisciplinarity comes in. When you speak about it, you need people who come from these different disciplines and to get them to work uh, together. Only then will you have the right kind of regulation and laws that we need so that people have the trust and say, well, you know, like when you move in traffic, you know, there are traffic regulations, you know, um, there is a law to protect you. And um, so this, this I, I think, is, is very important. So I can only say it was mainly data coming from the medical field. But at the same time, we are seeing now uh, the importance of data much more generally, because if you are doing simulation models, you need very good data. And simulation models allow you for any kind of question um, if you work with complex systems, they allow you to say what will happen under the condition that. And you can involve citizens in that as well. You let them pose a question, you know. If you put, if you take off one hospital in a region, what will happen to, to health care? You can do it with a simulation model. And then, you know, the political decision is another matter, but still you can do a lot with simulation models. And you can start developing um, video games, get the kids involved already in this kind of process, let them play with what happens if. Uh, and uh, kids are great in, with their imagination and with their love of playing. And so I think there's a lot to be done, but you have to do it in an interdisciplinary way and to involve citizens, because otherwise, as we had already with the um, uh, with, with the genetically modified organisms, where Europe lost out, you know, we lost out because we had these <clears throat> discussions that uh, did not lead us anywhere. No? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Angela. That's very interesting. Interdisciplinarity comes in again and openness, so involving the user. In right. the, 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 the process of, of, of science, if you wish. Um, Luigi, what's your take about which has been, has there been any kind of you know, step change at this uh, pandemic? As well, to do? well I, I, I guess there is two aspects I'd like to, to point out to complement uh, Professor Novotny's uh, uh, reply. Uh, one is that a major change has been the level of cooperation that obviously we saw in the pandemic. And the main example was the fact that Apple and Google agreed on a standard. Now, uh, a lot of people have discussed how do we transfer data from the operators. When you have Android and iOS, the two major operating systems in the world, agree on a standard that settled forever. And that was probably only doable in a pandemic in such a short time. Maybe if they had started a discussion after a while, they would have reached an agreement, maybe not. But I think that was a major step change in, our, in data collection. The other point is that how do we use data as anticipation? Uh, what I mean is uh, as anticipation is something that might occur. What, what I mean is that, uh, as I was saying before, data are pointing in the right direction, i.e. that uh, the pandemic is receding in Italy and throughout Europe. Uh, however, we need to use data cleverly to collect 
and identify what is called typically in the jargon weak signal, you know, segnali deboli. So, so we need to understand when something is coming. So we need to prepare systems that identify potential return of the pandemic. One of the major issues that we had, including in Italy, was that the virus was around and nobody noticed for a while. By the time we noticed, there were already enough damage done and it was a bit difficult, in fact, very difficult, to bring it back under control. Uh, we need to have the tools and data management, uh, it's, it's, it's very similar, it's very useful for that, to understand. In this respect, I think in healthcare, it will become very important uh, in order to measure and uh, prevent these sort of things from happening. And by the way, in Italy, we'll need to have a coordination between the very regional systems because you need to have uh, one quick reply and one, one uh, let's say, one point where all the data collected arrives in order to examine what's going on on the national territory. So I, I think this uh, this basically we, we learn a, a major lesson uh, and we need to make sure that this is not happen again. Yeah, well, that's extremely interesting. You, you touched upon the issue of different levels of cooperation that need to be put in place in order to address um, pandemics or problems which have that kind of of of, uh, of sides of of of, uh, of uh, implications. Uh, and of course, you know, just to build upon what you mentioned and also what Elga mentioned at the beginning, the the cooperation at the sovereign national level is even more important when you, you need to. For instance, put together you know large databases to better understand that something is is is, is happening. And then there's another thing that I'd like to underline what you just mentioned, Luigi, the importance of having some kind of sensors to detect weak signals. Uh, so probably uh, develop the kind of sense making skills or sense giving approach to, um, of course, people or organization at, at large is going to be a key skill. Uh, in, in, in the future. Um, one question that I'd like to, to ask, given the fact that, uh, you know, as you may imagine, and Louis, we're very interested, what do you think about which are going to be the, besides this, you know, data analytics, data management, and all the skills related to data that we are trying to develop, of course, across universities, but for instance, even in Louis, although we are, say, just a social science university, we are investing a lot in this kind of skills. We launched programs also for social scientists to better understand uh, algorithms, machine learning, and, 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 and the likes. Um, which are the, 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 the skills or the competences that you think are going to be required to address these kind of issues in the future? So if you were to, to, to offer advice, to give advice to uh, say, graduate students, or even students in general, what would be your your, your piece of suggestion around it? Elga? Well, I think it is very important to bring together people who work in computer science, in engineering, in development, with social scientists and even with some humanists. Hmm. And uh, people have to learn to talk to each other, they have to learn to listen to each other, because only we, we need a, a shared mindset. Because mm. otherwise, you know, you are parceling a problem in the way how you have been taught to manage a problem and you stick to it. And the other one does exactly the same, but in a different way. And then it's very difficult to get the two um, approaches together. And then you need, again, you know, the law is very important and, and regulation and think about it. And um, because Paula mentioned, you know, self-declaration and, and things of this kind. Um, <clears throat> I mean, we also have very sensitive data. Let me uh, bring just one example. If you want to know, does Italy have enough food <clears throat> in the country in case, you know, <clears throat> you cannot get food from outside or, you know, an example of this kind. You need to get data from the firms where the food is stored. Now, they will only give you the data under certain conditions. 
if you want them online and uh, the data needs to be um, live data, so to say, like in a traffic jam, you need live data if you want to, to regulate the traffic properly. So you need certain conditions and um, all this has to be thought together. So I would say, you know, create a climate where people find it exciting to talk to each other. Very interesting. I like very much the, the concept and the idea of shared mindset. So someone who's able to sort of to, to say to open and op off different kind of mindset from social sciences to hard sciences or even to arts and humanities. Luigi, what would be your take in regarding to... Uh, it is uh, data scientists' time. I mean, there is not enough graduates in uh, those type of subjects. So information, uh, uh, science, uh, uh, we as a firm are looking for data scientists all the time. Uh, having said that, I would say that in all profession is changing the angle. Uh, in, for example, even talking about lawyers, lawyers uh, uh, that understand this type of problematics is not that many. And uh, uh, the same is true for, you know, I used to study political science, the world is changing in this respect. So I think that uh, in whatever we do, um, we need to take a look at how the as the world around us it's uh, it, it's it's evolving, and that's the challenge for the university as well. By the way, when I mentioned about detecting weak signals, by the way, that's a typical technology of cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. Since uh, talking about not a regular virus but cyber virus, the way viruses typically attack is they are sounding the defense; they appear here and there. And so, for example, the technology that uh, you know large companies use is to detect these signals that something is appearing, and uh, then you have to analyze and understand what sort of threats you have. Mm -hmm. And the same has to apply to real life. So, even so about well, you know, Lewis is now doing cybersecurity courses. I mean, what is the typical profile of somebody that cybersecurity? Of course, you need to have computer science base, but uh, it's important that you have uh, an angle of uh, how the law around cybersecurity works, about the economics of it. So I, I think this is uh, the evolution is also somehow softening the boundaries between traditional discipline. So uh, you want to have a lawyer that knows his law, but also knows how, how to use a computer and uh, the law around it, and, and vice versa. You don't need nerds. You need people that have a more rounded uh, formation. I mean, some nerds are useful, but in general, you need people that have an overall uh, ability to act uh, between the, in, in different disciplines. The, conce the concept of collaboration and convergence apply also to academia. You, you need to be able to, uh, you know, take from different fields the best and be able to understand uh, how to apply to one field uh, what's being uh, somehow uh, evolving already in, a, in another one. Yeah. Well, that, that's very, very interesting. Thanks for, for mentioning our work on cybersecurity. Of course, you know, being a social science university, we do offer programs which uh, build upon computer science skills. But of course, we offer the political science perspective, the law perspective and the management perspective. And also, uh, of course, I'm not bragging about my university, but we've just launched a program on law and digital innovation exactly to address the problems of lawyers that have to know about, lawyers that have to know about how technology evolves and how to regulate it. Even the metaphor used by Helga is very interesting. Technology is upstream and law is, is downstream, and so law has to somehow to create a perimeter around which or within which technology is supposed to, to evolve. Well, you know, we it's, it's just one hour, 60 minutes, so it's it's fine. It's, we've got a great discussion. I, I'm pretty sure we, given the number of, of questions that we are receiving, we would have gone along for another couple of hours. But, you know, we live in digital time, so we're learning that uh, in digital time we need to be uh, quick, but, you know, insightful, and I think we did. So thanks a lot to Elga Novotny and Luigi Govitosi, and, uh, and see you for all that are listening to us. This upcoming Thursday, we're going to be having a masterclass on health policy. Uh, we're going to be having Paola Mattei as an academic, who is a professor of health policy at the University of Milan, and, uh, and uh, Pierluigi Antonelli, who is the CEO of Angelini Pharma. 
let me welcome back Paula. Severino will, yes, I am will, here. Will, uh, uh, will, uh, and I uh, appreciated, uh, appreciated the uh, Luigi's uh, speech about uh, the last part about lawyers, about cybersecurity, about uh, this multi faced phenomenon. Uh, um, you are totally right, uh, Luigi. I have nothing to add. <laughs> Uh, but I would like to thank all of you for being with us. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much again, and I'll see you Thursday then. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thanks. Sorry.